Um, my name is Ann Meyer, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Programs in CLA. So thanks for joining us, everyone, for this uh, roundtable on writing your first grant. It's uh, before I get started and introduce, I, I wanted to introduce uh, people from my office who help people write their first and their second and their third and their fourth grant. And that is Alexandra Brown. Alexandra, can you wave? So people know, yeah. And she um, helps folks in the arts and humanities who are applying for funding. So Alexandra will probably pipe in during the round table with insights from her work with the arts and humanities folks on preparing grants. Hi, Alexandra. Hi. Yeah, and then uh, Chris Opsel. Chris, can you wave? She is the research development coordinator for the social sciences. So she does the job very similar to Alexandra's, but with the uh, disciplines in the social sciences. So also Chris will hopefully pipe in with some of her insights later. And before I introduce Alice, who's gonna kind of kick us off today, I just wanted to um, give a little shout out to how exciting it is to be writing your first grant or to be thinking about writing your first grant proposal. It's your chance to be a uh, uh, producer of knowledge instead of, I don't know, in graduate school, I always felt like I was reading journal articles and books and consuming a lot of knowledge. And it's your chance to kind of put yourself out there uh, and be a producer of knowledge. So I think it's it's really exciting. Um, I know it's also intimidating because I've been there. You know, any of us who have written a grant have written a first grant too. And so it can be really intimidating uh, and it doesn't always equate to to winning. Uh, you might not win that first grant, but you have to get started to eventually um, to eventually win a grant. And I was just as I was preparing last night for this, I was reading an article in Nature on that note that said um, on, on the same day that molecular biologist Carol Greeter won a Nobel Prize in 2009, she learned that her recently submitted grant proposal had been rejected. So even Nobel Prize winners get their grant proposals rejected. So just, you know, that can happen, but it also might not happen and it won't happen every time if you keep at it and you can follow some of the steps we'll talk about today, you have a much better chance um, at actually being successful. So you should be excited about thinking about this. Uh, and I wanted to then move to introducing uh, Alice Lovejoy, who is an associate professor and the director of graduate studies in cultural studies and comparative literature and her work is in film media uh, and cultural um, history and she's had a lot of success in the grant writing world both uh, outside of the university with foundations uh, like well for example with the Fulbright Hayes uh, Foundation with Fulbright itself with the American Council of Learned Societies she also has had success within the University of Minnesota research uh, competitions like the Tolly Faculty Research Award and the McKnight Land Grant Professorship. And so she's a good one for us to be hearing from and getting tips from on um, and how to prepare grants. And, and, and I'll also weigh in, weigh in after Alice is done, or if I have a, a few comments here and there as she's speaking. And so we're kind of speaking a little bit from Alice from the humanities side and me a little bit more from the social sciences side. So. Um, and it's okay with me and Alice, when you start, you'll tell us if it's okay with you if people kind of raise questions as you're talking. So Alice, go ahead. Thanks, Anne, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, and absolutely, it's fine if you want to um, raise your hand or put a question in the chat while we're talking. I think that's great. This is going to be a pretty informal conversation, as Anne has just said. Um, she and Chris and Alexander will jump in from time to time. Um, we have a number of different perspectives here, both disciplinary and um, logistical. So, um, so I think you know there's a lot to be learned. Um, and I will also say that that anecdote about the Nobel Prize is really great. I mean, I, I have gotten grants, and I've also not gotten grants, and I think that's just the story for all of us. So, um, so what I want to talk about today mostly is the writing side of this process, um, because this is a very particular style of writing, grant and fellowship application writing. Um, it's something that needs time and practice. I think when I wrote my first um, fellowship applications in graduate school for dissertation research, I think I went through 13 versions of my proposal, um, and, and, and then it was done. It felt done. Um, so, you know, maybe you don't need 13 <laughs> drafts, but, um, but you need a lot of drafts. And that's something that you want to prepare for as you start to think um, about writing these applications is that you need to start early. 
um, and do some legwork um, before you begin. So I'm going to talk through some of those um, logistical aspects, the sort of the legwork you need to do, and then some of the writing specific aspects. Um, so the first thing uh, I want to mention is that you need to follow application guidelines precisely. Um, this might seem easy, but it's actually complicated because every fellowship or grant has its own guidelines. So does it ask for um, particular sections? Uh, use those sections, right, and put them in with section headings. Does it ask for you to mention particular things? Um, some grants want you to talk about the policy relevance of your work. Um, make sure to put those in. Does it ask for you to use particular fonts or margin sizes or word count or page length, etc.? you should do all of this. So some of you, um, if you're graduate students, might be applying for the SSRC, the IDRF, um, which requires, I think, 11 point font, right? There, there are things that are very specific about these um, applications that you need to pay attention to. Um, the second big thing that I want to mention is that for the most part, um, you are writing for a generalist or a non-specialist audience. Um, so what does this mean? So the makeup of um, review panels for grants and fellowships varies, but um, you should assume that your reader is not a specialist in your field and much less your subfield. And this is particularly the case if you're a graduate student applying for Fulbright, Fulbright-Hayes, um, SSRC, um, if you're um, a faculty member applying for NEH, et cetera. I think there's maybe more subject specificity in NEH, but not necessarily. Um, so you need to explain in layperson's terms what the project is and what it means, what its significance is. Um, so to go a little more deeply into this, um, this means explaining all jargon, which means discipline specific terms. Um, theoretical terminology such as biopolitics, right? That's a term that would need to be explained um, in a grant application. Um, methodological terminology that may not be um, used outside of your field. All of those things need to be explained briefly. Um, so, um, in terms of methodology, if you're a literature scholar um, or a film scholar, um, and this is a general interest fellowship like the Fulbright, you need to explain what it means um, to be doing close reading. I'll talk about that more um, later on. Other things that you need to explain are historical background um, or other kinds of background that you know make the you know situate the project. Right, essentially, you want to hold your reader. Um, by the hand without talking down to them and walk them into um, your field and your subfield, um, which is difficult to do if you have three pages in which to do it, right? So that's the kind of balancing act that you wanna have. Um, so a tip that, um, that I think is really helpful with this is to have multiple people read your draft both in your field and outside of it. I have had my cousin who's a biologist <laughs> read my fellowship applications and it's enormously helpful because he's able to pick up on um, what, you know, what makes sense to a general reader, a general educated reader and what makes sense um, you know, only within the discipline. Um, you also want readers who are going to be critical. I think um, some of you are graduate students, if you are um, working with your colleagues, it can, it can be great to share drafts as long as you make a pact that you will um, give each other, you know, constructive criticism as well, right, because that, that's really um, important. Um, in terms of the meat of the proposal, um, one of the things that's really important, and I know Alexandra and I have talked about this before, she may have things to add, um, is the introduction. So the, the beginning of the proposal is extremely important. Um, it should do, it has to do a lot of things at once. It should encompass both the big ideas and the resonance and significance of the project, as well as its topic. Um, and it's important both because it has to serve all of these roles and because grant review panels are reading a lot of proposals and people are tired. Um, and so often it's the beginning of the proposal that, that has to do the work of grabbing readers um, and, and bringing them in. So, um, so there's a reason to sort of front load a lot of your um, most um, captivating or interesting material. So, um, so you want this to grab people, right? Is there a question that you can lead off with? Is there a hook of some sort? Is there a paradox that you want to raise um, that your, your research intervenes in? Um, is there a narrative that can bring the reader quickly into the middle of a scene that highlights the questions you're considering? So if are you doing field work, it, can you speak to something that emerged in the course of your research that really um, raises these questions that you want to answer in the course of your work? Um, one of the uh, tips here that I think is helpful is to, um, to think about 
uh, explaining your project verbally. This is something that people often think about in terms of the job market too, when you have your elevator speech about your project. How do you compress the, um, what your project is and the importance of it into say um, a paragraph and then into three sentences and then into one sentence? How much can you front load um, while also making it read well and be um, gripping um, so that it all, you know, it shows up at the beginning, right? So the significance and the topic. Alexander, do you want to add anything to that? I know we've we've talked about introductions before. Yeah, I mean, I think Alice talked about some good approaches, how to begin an introduction. A narrative or a vignette can be very useful if it, if you, it's not just the story has to take you into the heart of your, your research question, your central research question. So by the end of the introduction, you, Readers need to know your central research question, the scope of your work. If there's anything else that, for example, the funder might say, are you applying for this level grant? They may wanna know that in the introduction, that'll be in the guidelines, um, that sort of thing. Um, it's really important not to weigh, let make readers go too far into the proposal to get what you're doing, to, to explain what the heart of your research is, because by then you've lost them. And they've already sort of maybe formed an impression of their in their mind that your work is not that interesting, or you don't really know what it's about or something like that. So because they're starting to form their opinion from the very first word, you need to take very special care with the introduction. That's probably the part I would work on the most, writing and rewriting and writing it. Yeah, so I think that's, I mean, this is all really critical. So that's the, that's the beginning of your proposal. And when you're thinking about the format, I'm gonna give you kind of a schematic overview of the formats that I've encountered, but Anne and Chris and Alexander may have other formats that, um, that appear in different disciplines and grants. But usually there's an abstract, which is a separate part of the proposal, which will be usually 100 to 150 words. Um, I think it can vary. Um, and, and some of the things that Alexandra has just talked about are um, applicable to the abstract as well. You want it to do the work of encapsulating your project and its significance of, um, of, you know, in doing so succinctly. Um, so there is an art to writing these. Um, this is not a throwaway part of the project, right? Um, this is, you know, as Alexandra said, it's something that you want to spend a significant amount of time with. Um, so I have in the past been uh, forgotten to write the abstract and then realized that I was half an hour before the grant submission deadline and had to put one together. So I would um, encourage you not to do that <laughs> um, and to start early with that because it's really, really important. Um, when you get into the, the, the project proposal itself, the proposal itself, um, we've just talked about the introduction and um, often this introduction is part of the project description um, where you are describing your topic, the problems you're investigating, the questions that you're asking, the central research topic. Um, often you see these framed um, somewhere in the project description as questions, right? how I ask did X do Y? Um, and what does this mean for our understanding of Z, right? Um, and um, so, which is to say that the project description should also speak to the significance of the project too, although you'll also deal with that um, later. Does anybody wanna add something to, to that part? Project description? Um, essentially, this is where you're doing the work of saying, I am investigating this topic in these places, looking at these questions. Well, your project description is typically what we would call the proposal, right? So it, it deals that, I mean, is that what you mean? Or you think yeah, sorry, involved? Alexander. Um, what I meant is that this, there are sections, let me go through the overview of the section. So usually okay. in a proposal, you'll have the description of the project um, and then a, a section on the significance or its relationship to the field, and okay. then a section on your methods, and then a section on your plan of work. Um, I guess in my, in my um, experience. So um, it might be called, I think NEH calls it something different. Um, every every grant body will have a different term for it, but um, these are different sections that go into the proposal. And um, it's a very good idea to set them off by section headings, with section headings, right? Mm -hmm. So to say, this is the methods section, 
this is the significance section, the relationship to the field section, however you, um, however you phrase it, the plan of work, et cetera. And so if we're talking about that first part where you're really getting into the meat of describing the project, that's where you want to do this work of um, framing the questions, framing the topic, and then hinting at the significance, but you'll get more deeply into the significance later. But again, there are different ways to, um, to break this apart. Yeah, Alice, can I just jump in there? One thing about that is these are usually sections, but sometimes they might also align with criteria for evaluation. So I know, for example, in a lot of NIH grants, they'll have a significant section and or criteria. And so it really does help to put the header as significance and then feed that to them. And they'll have an innovation criteria and you'll put that as a header and, and feed that to them. And so uh, um, you know, and a approach or method section like that. So it's not just to organize it so that it's readable for you, but it's where they'll go when they're filling out their criteria template on for to evaluate you. So you want to, you know, really use it wisely. I would also add that they uh, sometimes these are separate documents. So I've seen like the work plan be a standalone document, and I've seen it also be a portion of the main proposal. Um, I would say too, in this main section or document where you lay out your research questions, make sure they align with the rest of the proposal. I read one a couple of weeks ago where there were three research questions and then there were um, four expected products. And I'm like, so so do the three mesh with the four? Like, like should there only be three products then one for each research question? Or so just make sure you keep that structure moving on um, to help orient people. Yeah, and I'll also just say the section, I affirm that the section headings are really crucial for the reasons already laid out, but they're going to vary by funder. So there are certain sort of typical kinds of ways of organizing a proposal. But if, for example, like an NIH um, narrative differs from um, an NSF from an NEH, you know, depending on the discipline, depending on the funder, the the structure of the proposal will differ. So that's why you need to closely pay attention to the guidelines in order to understand that. Yeah, that's really crucial. Yeah, so uh, read the instructions, know what you're doing, and then put the headings in. And as Anna said, those headings are going to help them help the readers evaluate you as well. Yeah, so, and, and there's always a section on um, significance, right, or situating your work in relationship to the field. And that um, that is something that, um, you know, it's, it should be pretty straightforward. You're discussing where your work fits in with current debates in your field or the fields with which you interact um, if you're doing interdisciplinary work. Um, so this is where you want to set out the works that you draw on, the works that you are in dialogue with, the concepts that you challenge, etc. Um, you're essentially setting up the intellectual landscape for your project um, and positioning yourself within it. And then as a way to say what is significant about your work, right? How it intervenes in the field or in larger questions. Um, and one of the things that I, I think is helpful to think about in this regard is that you don't need to set up a straw man, right? You don't need to make, you know, be concerned about how important your project is because, um, you know, we often try to, you know, talk about uh, our projects as, as having these kind of major interventions, but sometimes the interventions are um, on a more new are more nuanced than you think, right? So you're not necessarily totally transforming the study of media, but you're transforming these important debates in the study of media, right? In my case, um, so um, it's okay not to say things like I am. Um, you know, challenging this long-standing narrative in media. It's okay to say, I am in dialogue with certain scholars. I am articulating a new understanding of this particular problem. I think, I, I guess I'm just thinking about when I was doing this at the beginning and thinking how revolutionary do our interventions need to be? And sometimes our interventions are smaller, but yet equally important. And so I think that's something that's important to think about here. Um, other thoughts on this from my colleagues? Yeah, I mean, it's important not to overreach, but also it's important to definitely be clear about what is new about your project. And so, like, you can be in dialogue with, a, I see this commonly, well, this, this sort of I draw upon, or I am influenced by so-and-so's idea, 
And then they go on to explain that and they haven't told us what's new. And it's, and the what's new is really important in that because I mean, they're not funding so-and-so, they're funding you. So you need to give them a reason to do that. And I think especially in these competitions where you're up against people from other fields, like the doctoral dissertation fellowship, for example, the grant and aid, if you're a faculty member, um, the temptation is to feel sort of self-conscious because you're not curing cancer, right? Like you're up against biologists who might legitimately be doing that. And, and the thing is like, I think this is a great point Alice is making because you're doing something significant and your job again is to educate the reviewers as to its significance. And it may take more than someone who could say, well, I'm, I'm on the path to curing cancer, right? But, but this is just part of your whole project of your proposal, which is to take the reader by the hand and say, this is why this matters. Um, and it all matters, right? Or you wouldn't be working on it, but your job is to articulate that kind of on the, on the level that it is, like claim the significance that you have. You don't need to exaggerate it, but your proposal needs to like align with that and encompass it to the full extent that it is. Thanks. That's really, yeah, that's really helpful. And I think this is, this can be challenging, especially when you're at the beginning of a project and you are still working out what the significance is. So um, you just, do, you know, especially when you're, this is dissertation research that you're funding. And I think it just do the best that you can with the material that you have and know that your project is going to keep evolving over the course of the research that you're trying to fund, right? So that's, this is just part of the process for everybody. Um, the next thing of, uh, that is always um, part of a proposal is your methods, how you do what you do. Um, again, often written in layperson's terms, but I know this will this will vary by um, by fellowship and, and grant. I you know I don't know anything about the NSF or NIH, um, but in terms of humanities, this is something that we don't talk about enough. I think. Um, because we often take um, method kind of for granted. So um, when you are writing a proposal as a humanist, um, you will need to talk about the, how you do um, your research. Are you doing interviews? Are you watching films? Are you reading books? Are you analyzing works of art? Are you going to archives and looking at files related to a particular question? Um, uh, in some fields, there is theoretical grounding that's important to positioning your methods in the field. So mentioning those would be helpful as well. Um, so I think it's important, especially if you're working in the humanities and not used to writing about your methods or thinking about your methods, to spend some time thinking about this and finding a way to talk to or write to a non-specialist about how you do the work that you do. Um, so I will be spending um, one month closely reading this um, edition of Proust. And I, through that, I will be looking for X, Y, and Z, and then, you know, describing what that, what that, what the importance of that is. Um, and here, I would be really curious to hear from other, um, and, you know, in particular, other fields. Yeah, thanks. My pipes are banging. I don't know if you'll hear them in the background, so I apologize for that. Um, I think in the social sciences, it it probably depends depends a bit on the funding agency. So if you're applying for a graduate student um, or which more likely faculty um, research grants to NIH, you might have like more specificity in your methods section, but you'll still want to know what kind of they have groups that review what study section will be reviewing my application and what um, you know, is that going to be economists more likely or anthropologists? And that might, you know, determine how you're going to talk about your methodology. I think probably a good uh, place to start is to maybe get some past successful examples from the competition to which you're applying and just see how did they talk about their methods and try and understand if they kind of like um, distilled it into something more digestible for a bit broader of an audience, or if they felt the need to kind of double down on the technicality. I think I know myself when I was a graduate student, I always felt I was kind of in the mode of proving myself. And this is the same with jargon. You want to show what you know kind of thing. Um, and you're used to being in your disciplinary kind of audience. And so with methods too, I think it's good to always look at your methods and, and your kind of field and uh, take a step back and say, you know, how, how would I bring this to my cousin? How would I discuss this with my grandmother or whatever? Um, and tone, tone down a little bit the technicality in the methods and a little bit the, um, the jargon and disciplinary sorts of jargon as well. But I think it, it really depends on the funder and then you can get a good quick insight by looking at past applications. 
And I've seen comments um, in critical reviews of proposals in which they've said, you know, you need to tell us more than you're doing interviews. How are you selecting your interview subjects? What sort of, what, how are you, what sort of interviews are you doing? That sort of thing. Um, do you have anything to say about that or? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I would say that that's true. I think um, in the social sciences, you'll probably have reviewers that are tend towards the more quantitative method side and some that tend towards the more qualitative method side and they can both be critical of each other, but certainly, um, you know, maybe it doesn't hurt as a uh, someone who's doing interviews to talk about the number and how you're selecting your sample and why you're making those choices. If you're trying to stratify on race or on gender or something like that in your choice of recipients uh, or uh, of interviewees so that they, you know, they then know that um, this is part of your plan and it, it is driven by your research question. So I think a little bit more detail on that sort of thing could be important. Similarly for, um, for quantitative analysis, like for example, a lot of quantitative studies will, people will be concerned about whether you have enough cases to make the claims that you're making as well. And so they they will do ask for what's called a power analysis and that's kind of a technical process, but you could maybe say, I conducted a, a power analysis following the example of, and then cite the, the power analysis kind of, keystone articles in that area and not describe it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, or you could say in the power analysis resulted in, in, you know, in this, and that gives me confidence that my sample will be large enough, but you're not going to like put the equation for the power analysis in your application. And, um, you know, because that's like not the main thing you're doing, that's the thing to make sure that you have a big enough sample that you'll be doing your main analysis on. So it's it's a, a bit of a tightrope, but you know, this is also why we have people like Alexandra and Chris who can help you figure out like the level at which you should be writing and and um, you know, they see so many proposals that come through that they kind of know like this one seems so heavy and unless the in the technical details and unless the funder is asking for that, um, or it is a particular kind of funder that seems off, you know, that seems like too much. So I would definitely use the professionals in this case. And I'll drop information for how to reach us in the chat, but um, I wanted to add as well. So this begs the question, I think, especially when you're writing your first grant of how much do I need to say about my methods? I haven't done the study yet, right? Like, I don't know necessarily what categories I'm going to find when I analyze this data or or that kind of thing, right? Like, like how far down the path are they expecting me to go? And I think this is part of where um, other research that you've done can be really helpful. So if you've taken a class where you had to learn how to do interviewing and you had to analyze the data or you've presented at conferences or whatever, you have a good sense of what that process is. And you can talk about, you know, in previous projects, I have done the following and I expect to do similar things here, which also shows the feasibility, right? That you have the skills needed to carry this thing out. Um, reviewers know you haven't done this. That's the whole point. Um, and, you know, you, you can take them right up to the point of, I expect to analyze the data in this way. There will probably be categories and trees and nodes and all of these things. I can't say what those are yet because that's not the paradigm I'm using. Um, that kind of thing. So, so say as much as you can, but don't feel like you have to overpromise. They know that you haven't done the project. So um, you know, be come off as as though you know the approach and the methods, and you're familiar with what it's going to take to carry this out. But they're not expecting you to know what the result will be or even what the general contours of it are probably. This is really fascinating I, for me to learn about these things too. Um, so I think, um, uh, Chris, you just mentioned um, this question of sort of your preparation and the projects that you've done before. And I think that's a really important part of the, um, the plan of work also and the methods. This can go between the two. Um, often when you're writing the plan of work section, um, in addition to giving a kind of detailed outline of what you'll be doing throughout the course of the project, um, you also want to talk about your preparation. So what preliminary research have you already done briefly? 
Um, what if languages are a relevant part of this? What language preparation do you have? Right? Do you speak fluent Arabic? And your research. Um, this is the research that you're the language that you're doing your research in. Um, what contacts have you made? Um, how does this draw on again your other projects, recent um, articles, books, etc. Um, in terms of outlining what you'll be doing, you really need to be very specific here, as specific as you can be. So, um, I, and Alec, Chris and Alexander might um, have advice about this, but I think a month by month, if it's a year long fellowship, um, for instance, a month by month outline is appropriate. Um, so um, in September and November, I will be conducting research in this archive using these collections or files, right? Um, in December and January, I will be writing chapter two um, using these sources, things like that. So you, they want to know that your work is feasible in the timeline that you're proposing. Um, and so giving that detail is always important. Now, of course, um, I always talk about a colleague of mine from graduate school who got to their research site and the archive was flooded <laughs> and, they, and they couldn't do the research um, in the archive. And so things happen, right? You, you don't know what the um, future will hold. Um, and there are things that are out of your control, but you should map this out to the best of your ability. Um, and especially if you're doing archival work, um, giving the detail about um, you know, the files you're using, the collections you're using, et cetera, is very helpful. Yeah, and right, pandemics, <laughs> that, that's upended a lot of research. Well, and I've, I've told people too, and I've, I've had to address this question. Um, you know, they, they say, I can't go to X place because of the pandemic. I can't get at X archives or collect X data. Everyone has experienced the pandemic, right? It's not like this is uniquely uh, affecting you. And the point is just to be, um, be very honest and straightforward about it, say, you know, I, I had planned to be at this point in my research, and maybe it means waiting for another funding cycle to come around. Maybe your, your project has been so delayed, but, um, and hopefully we're coming out of this and more and more of that will become feasible, but it's always good, I think, you know, to acknowledge, sometimes I, I read proposals and I feel like the pandemic is conspicuously absent, right? Like you're writing it as though there will be no barriers to travel or access or um, encountering humans face to face, right? And, and there may well be again in the future as much as I hate to say it, but um, acknowledge that we know that these things may occur, have a backup plan if it's possible. So I read a, a dissertation grant proposal where the woman was like, ideally I would like to go to Africa and observe the following. If I can't do that, I will get the documents from people and I will, you know, do a close reading of them. I will shift my methods, but I will try to get at the same sorts of topic questions that I would have been examining had I been able to witness these things. So, um, you know, if that's appropriate, work that in as well. I think one thing to add to this too, um, in terms of uh, of making your making these things transparent, is that you need to describe, um, especially for the DDF. I think this is important. Why funding will be helpful, right? So, are are you in a graduate program that is um, requires you to TA um, or to or to GSI um, for your stipend? Um, so, it, and is the DDF going to allow you that time free of teaching responsibilities to do that work? Similarly, for other kinds of fellowships, right? Normally, you would need to teach. This will free me of teaching responsibilities to be able to carry out this field work, etc. Right, the dissertation. So, just um, showing that clearly. Um, just a couple other things, and then we can, I think, um, uh, you know, move to other other topics and Q and A. Um, a few uh, um, pieces of advice: um, be concrete as much as possible, right, in describing and showing what you want to do, um, and discussing your work, um, and describing your need for funding. Um, when you're writing, your prose should be, you should be using shorter sentences rather than longer sentences, um, again, avoiding jargon. Everything should be clear and to the point. Remember that your readers are tired. <laughs> and so these short sentences help them, shorter, not, you know, not necessarily very short sentences, but shorter sentences help you get through um, a proposal. Um, I think avoiding the passive voice is a good idea. The passive voice is hard. It makes your sentences longer and sometimes difficult to follow. Um, and I think being assertive is something that's important too. So instead of saying, I hope to do this, saying, I will do this. And again, this is writing yourself into a future that doesn't yet exist, but that's, that's the art of this process is just saying, I will do X, Y, and Z. Um, Footnotes is a question that I would defer to Chris and Alexandra on to, um, refer to Chris and Alexandra on. Um, 
because sometimes you, you can use them, but I think in general, it's best not to use footnotes um, to put you know, the proposal in the, in the text. Um, fellowships that ask for an affiliation. So the Fulbright is a big one here. Uh, Fulbright, Fulbright Hayes, you're gonna need an affiliation abroad. Start early on this, um, seek out your affiliations um, uh, very early. Um, sometimes these will need approval from various levels of bureaucracy in the country in question. Um, and so the earlier you start that process, um, the better. Alexander, did, did you want to? I was going to say that footnotes is in partly it's disciplinary. So, or, you know, like the great, the sections of the kind of fields you work in. Um, I think for most humanities proposals, unless they ask for references, you don't need, you don't need to cite full references, but you might when you reference key authors, you might put in parentheses like the year of their work or something like that, or the last name and the year of their work. My understanding is in some of the social sciences, you do need references and probably Chris and Ann can speak to that. Often I see them as a separate document. So I think NSF and NIH both actually want them in their own space. Um, so that's how it's usually handled for us. So like a bibliography or a bibliography, but then in the text, are they citing sources too within the text? Um, there would be intertextual ones. Yeah, I mean, just like in parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so for the humanities, if you're if you're used to citing in Chicago style, you shouldn't be using Chicago style. And what Alexander is saying is so, you know, putting like last name, date, and then you usually have a work cited. Um, option but not always for fellowships yeah and it's not that it's not a paper for publication so you don't need to cite as though you were writing it for publication you cite the key you reference the key authors in your field that are necessary to establish to situate your own work so that's that's how you really do it in the humanities would you agree alice yeah, I think so. I mean, I think um, so some fellowships will have your bibliography and that's where you put both the works that you're citing in your kind of significant section, right? Mm -hmm. I'm in dialogue with these scholars and then maybe put their names in parentheses um, and then have a broader bibliography that just if if they turn to it, they'll know who you're reading and who you think you're in dialogue with. So it does serve a kind of dual function. You can mention texts in the bibliography that you don't have the space to mention um, in the significance too. So I do think there's there's some art to that document as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the last thing I wanted to mention just is to echo what Anne said that grant panels turn down many very, very worthy projects, um, not because of the project, right? For reasons that are beyond your control. Um, so it's not about you most of the time, <laughs> almost all of the time. Um, and the good news is that once you have a grant application written, you've done the legwork and um, you can um, use it for future applications or rework it. And um, sometimes you will also get the grant. So I think um, it's well worth doing. It's, it's a unique form of writing, but um, I found that um, Alexandra, I, I've worked with because I'm in Arts and Humanities has been enormously helpful as well. So there's lots of great resources here and your DGS um, uh, is also a good resource for things like the DDF. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Um, Let's, take, let's see if there are questions and uh, if so we can make sure we get your questions answered for those of you who might be thinking about or working on a grant proposal. Any things that you could use particular um, advice on? You can feel free to either unmute yourself and jump in at any point. Uh, I don't want to, you know, miss your your most important questions. I, there were a, a few things that um, Alice referred to that I had additional thoughts on, and um, in terms of, um, you know, your your reviewers, like Alice said, are probably tired. You can imagine maybe they have like a stack of fifty proposals, and they're grumpy and they're hungry, and not just tired. But you really, you know, want to make it easy for them. So we mentioned headers. Sometimes the headers or subheadings might align with review criteria. But also, if in your field it's common to use visuals like a chart or something to break up the text, 
a little bit of white space. Usually the cases that you have too much, um, you're not lit undergrad trying to stretch it out and like have, you know, big margins or anything. You have too much. But if you can in between those headers, like have one line of space or, you know, a little bit of white space. So it's not so overwhelming and tiring for them. I think that's, um, you know, a good a good idea overall. And that's those are the kinds of things that Alexander and Chris can really like look over your your application for and make suggestions on. And then um, Alice talked about the hook and I, and you know, or at the beginning, like something that really draws them in and, and Alexandra said like maybe a vignette or something like that. I think, you know, that part is really important for your tired, grumpy, hungry reviewer too, because they wanna be interested and, you know, you wanna do that, um, you know, right up front. And it's kind of like, that's the part where you're doing the most storytelling, where you're kind of almost entertaining them a little bit. So, or at least drawing them in. And so, um, you know, I think writing that, shopping that around to people, having them, you know, kind of comment on it, give you ideas. Sometimes when I have an idea and I shop it around to people in like a one page or even a one paragraph sort of thing, they see interesting things I didn't even see in it. Like, oh, this actually connects to this literature that I was less familiar with. And so I can see if I want to go that way. Maybe in the end, I dismiss that and think, well, no, I have to stay in this narrower space, but it kind of opens you up to other possibilities. So I think shopping around can be a really good idea. I see Marie has a question. Oh, to ask for other examples. Yes, Chris and Alexandra, I mean, I, I have done that as a graduate student and as a faculty member for people that I know who have won uh, competitions. So through my personal networks, but I believe there are some archives sometimes kept of those. Is Did we look into that, Alexandra? The grad school might have some. Uh, yes, the grad school has an archive of, I wish I had the link, I yeah. don't right now, has an archive of previously funded proposals that you can sign up to access um, if you promise not to share it with anyone. So everybody needs to sign up individually. And they have them for DDF, they have them for some external proposals as well as internal proposals. So that's useful. Some Funders have sample proposals on their websites. Most don't, but some do. Um, and then, yeah, you can ask around your department. You can ask your DGS, your advisor, or whoever to see if they know someone who may have one willing to share. Um, if you know someone who in your program who got the grant the year before, two years before, you can ask them. Um, sometimes you can ask the funder, but usually if they're gonna make them accessible, they'll be on the website. Well, and I definitely recommend that people even just write to PIs. You can look at previously funded grants on almost every website and um, of the funder. And I like to trust in the benevolence of the funding universe. Um, so if you write to someone and you say, you know, I'm a grad student or a junior faculty member working in this same space, I'm writing my first grant or I've never written an NSF before, would it be possible, you know, and they, they might even just send you, you know, a document or two from it, maybe perhaps not the entire proposal, but I definitely have had people respond and, and send the whole thing. I mean, everyone has an interest in improving the quality of, the field, right? So it never hurts to ask, even if it's completely cold. Yeah, I think also for a lot of graduate student grants, you can only get it once. So once you get it, so they're out of the competition pool for when you'll be applying. So, you know, there's no disincentive to them sharing. You're not going to be in direct competition. So I've, I found them quite willing to. I see I'm John put in the chat um, to access grad student proposals. Thanks, I'm John. Question from Beth. Uh, Beth, ask early, ask often. Uh, the sooner you ask us, the more helpful we can be. Um, and yes, anyone in the CLA community gets one of us. So whether you're on the arts and humanities side or the social science side, you're in one of our domain. Um, we can help you do everything from you know reading, 
the call for proposals, sizing up, you know, is this a good fit for me? What should I be looking out for as I write this? Are there, is there information I'm going to have to request from other entities, like Alice mentioned, internationally affiliates, those kinds of things. Um, we can review your proposal for you. Sometimes we do that multiple times. Um, we can help you connect to our colleague who does budgets. We can help you with the online proposal system, regardless of where it is. Um, seems like every entity has a different one. Um, so all of that, absolutely. We are here to help. This is our job. So please, I put our, our email CLA research at umn.edu. Um, if you don't know where to start, drop a line to that and we will send you to one of us and, and we'll help you get into our, our process. Two other things we can help with is one, helping you find funding. And there's a database called Pivot that the university subscribes to that you can learn how to use through the libraries. And then there's, if you Google on, on YouTube, um, pivot advanced search that's a helpful tutorial and this aggregates all kinds of funding opportunities so we would encourage you to to search pivot but we can also talk to you about grants that may be available the other thing we can help with is the submission process that may or may not have to go through the university and it's often can be tricky to figure out if it does need to go through the university or whether you apply directly to the funder and, um, you know, a lot of that depends on if they require a letter of endorsement from the university or some sort of signing off by the university, then you definitely have to go through SPA. Other cases, you may have to, SPA's offers, Office of Sponsored Projects at the University of Minnesota, who is actually the only entity allowed to apply for grants on behalf of the university. So some grants will be given to the university as opposed to you individually. Fulbright Hayes is like that. Um, so it can be confusing just figuring out whether you need to go through SPA or not, and we can help you figure that out. And then help, if you do, we can help guide you through that process. I see that question from uh, DJ in the... Um about policy relevance. I, I know in NSF applications, there's a broader impact section. I think a lot of people will put policy relevance in there and also in the significance of NIH applications, for example, I don't know in the humanities where that shows up, but I think um, this question that you have, Dee, is about whether um, you know you have to use kind of established laws that are relevant to the project. Some some disciplines will be really closely tied to policy, and the whole project will be motivated by some sort of policy concern. And others will be like this is the part where they're going to be kind of um, you know fishing around. So I think you don't want to be um, you know weighed deeply into a policy arena that you know nothing about to kind of pull pull that in in a way way that, you know, makes it seem really relevant because that would be like learning a, a lot right at the end um, of your kind of proposal writing or, you know, as you're writing this. But you, I think, you know, kind of if it, if you are in a field D that isn't policy focused in its nature, then um, I think, you know, this is where talking to lots of other people using Chris and Alexandra's services, talking to your colleagues in your department or even colleagues that you have outside of your department about like potential applications of the innovation that you're making that could be policy relevant or, um, you know, for example, I recently read um, an application or at least an abstract of an application that was about a new way um, of managing big data. And they indicated that like this can help with um, self-driving cars and, you know, robots and, and sorts of things that the actual work they were doing was not on self-driving cars. It was like a data management kind of platform. And so I imagine that if those aren't obvious to you right away, which for most of us, they, you know, they aren't, we don't always see all of those angles. Talking to enough people will help you see how you can hook into different kinds of policy arenas. But I'm not sure if others have thoughts on that. I would just say in the humanities where I have seen this come up is not often, but in, in um, area studies, it's one thing. So I work um, it partially in, in East European studies and that's where I've seen it come up. But I think it's much rarer in the humanities. 
Well, and I think too, you don't need to take it um, super literally. They're not asking you to propose laws, right? But they're asking you to say, you know, in the public sphere, what are the implications of your findings? If you were going to make broad changes in the world, or if you were going to inform a certain public policy debate, if you see something in the news, um, for example, um, and I happen to be familiar with, with these works, so this is one, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the news about um, transit, right? The, the Southwest light rail line and, and the controversies, you know, it's cost overruns and, and do we prolong this project or do we let it go? Um, you know, if you, if you can point to something like that in current events on the social sciences side in particular and say, this project might have something to say to that, say whether this is worthwhile or not um, to contribute to our understanding of traffic patterns in the metro area, which clearly we're trying to figure out what those traffic patterns are and how best to serve them. And that's an ongoing conversation. So, um, you know, I think the news is a great source for some of those things. It doesn't have to literally be the law, um, statutes, you don't need to wade into those things, but, but in the public sphere, what are the questions this project might help answer or inform debates? So. Then there are grants that are explicitly related to policy, which sometimes you just won't be eligible for, or you won't be able to make a good case for. It just depends on the nature of your work and what your relative fit for that grant or another is. Yeah, I mean, also it occurs to me that you could, you know, depending on um, your area, there might be somebody in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs that you could, you know, ask to read your one page or paragraph or just have a conversation with about what you're trying to do and just see if they know of any applications in, in you know, in their world where it might be useful. Um, what other, any other? Well, I had a question about applying for a grant for a creative project, specifically a McKnight Media Arts Grants. And um, I can talk to you more later, but the one thing I would um, advise in all arts grants is to start with a concept. Obviously, if you're doing a film or something, it's going to be about something. So that might be easier for you than a visual artist who hasn't necessarily thought about what their painting or drawing is going to be about. But um, yeah, we can definitely talk, communicate by email or set up a Zoom call to talk about that later. I have worked on a number of McKnight applications. So James, James Snapco. So just write me at CLA Research. We can set something up. Is anyone else here interested in creative grants? So I guess I'll just leave that to speak to James privately. One, one question, Alice, when you were talking about um, explaining terms and jargon, I was like, I, I often, you know, kind of think about doing that as well. And I think, well, should I be explaining the jargon or should I just take it out? Like, you know, like where in the mix, and I, I was actually just gonna ask Alexander and Chris, like, how do you do that? Do you, is it advisable to get rid of the jargon or is it advisable to kind of like leave some of it in and explain it? I mean, how, how do you advise on that sort of thing? Well, I would say wherever possible, leave it out. Mm -hmm. find plain English words for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that theoretically complicated work is bad mm -hmm. or is not suitable for a proposal. It's just that it's up to you to explain it without the jargon. Mm -hmm. There may be one or two concepts that you absolutely need to keep. And in those cases, explain it. But if you have a litany of discipline specific words that you're having to explain, the reader's not going to be able to follow them all. Mm -hmm. So really choose wisely what you want to keep in. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a balance. I wouldn't say scrap it all necessarily, but if it's a really short proposal and you simply don't have the space, I feel like sometimes too, if you uh, 
try to explain things in in plain language without also including the jargony word again it might be conspicuously absent right like your reviewer might say oh gosh don't they know that in this field that's called x you know and so um but this gets to sort of the elegant writing and the outside readers again right so there are ways to define things succinctly where you can mention the word have a quick phrase explaining what it is or an example examples are great um because they're concrete again but um you know and then you only have to define it the first time but but show that you know that the reader might not know but some readers might know um so i wouldn't i wouldn't categorically scrap them but again like just to be very very thoughtful about that and ask your outside reader is it clear after this eight or ten word description do you understand what i mean and sometimes too as you continue on through the proposal it becomes more and more clear as you talk about it um but but again it's sort of a language thing and just get lots of folks to read read your proposal and and tell you whether they understand what you're talking about um you know they're the best sense of that really great thank you any last questions we have just a few minutes if anyone had one they wanted to run by us If not, any parting thoughts, Alice? No, just uh, wish you all luck and I encourage you to do this. I mean, it's it's something that I can seem really daunting, but your research is fundable and I think it's just worth um, getting out there and, and trying it. Thanks for being yes. here. Yes, thanks so much, Alice, for, for your thoughts and to Chris and Alexandra too. And we're excited to see some of your proposals come through the research development team. So don't be shy about reaching out as Chris said early is, is great. And um, yeah, let us know if there are other ways you can think that we can help you. Otherwise, have a great day. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.